Good morning again. Merry Christmas and welcome. Good to see you all. I join Glenn in praying that you had a good Christmas. Um, but I also pray that we don't move too quickly past Christmas. I think too often when we move quickly through these great seasons of faith, we often will miss things that the Lord has for us. And I don't want to miss anything that he has for me, and I know you don't either. So I want us to kind of just uh, stay in the Christmas story for another day. And I want us to look at Luke's account of the birth of Jesus from Luke chapter 2. Maybe think about it from a little different perspective this morning. Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. In those days, Caesar's Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ, the Lord. <clears throat> and this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the words of our Lord stand forever. Father in heaven, indeed, this day, we praise you and thank you for sending us your son so long ago as that baby in Bethlehem. We pray that you would open our hearts and our minds up to see that you sent him simply because you valued us so much and you loved us so much. That in that, the joy that we have in that truth might overflow for your glory and your praise. That the world might see the infinite value that is in our Lord Jesus himself. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Um, I shared this story with some of you. I want to share it all with you this morning because it's really a pivotal event in my life. When I was in high school in the 12th grade, I had a teacher. Her name was Mrs. Acree. And Mrs. Acree did not like me at all. Now, I know some of you can go, amen. I can relate to this woman. And I, I understand that because most of my problems with her and anybody else is always at my doorstep. But Miss Acre particularly had it in for me, so much so that she had kind of made it clear that I was never going to graduate as long as she was my teacher. She did everything she could to keep me from graduating. But when she saw that that wasn't going to happen, she just really set out to make my life miserable. She just had it in for me. One day in a class in front of all of my classmates, she said very loudly and very clearly, Bill Evans, you are worthless, and you'll never amount to anything. Now, whoever said sticks and stones will break your bones, but words will never hurt you was full of it. Those words hurt, and they hurt deep into my soul. 
to a large degree, I came to believe those words were true. And listen, when you don't think very much about yourself, you will make a lot of foolish decisions and bad choices in your life. And that's exactly what I did. And those choices and decisions took me down some really dark roads of drug abuse for about 10 years. Now, I don't blame her. Those choices were mine. I actually thank her to some degree because God used all those dark roads to bring me to himself. I share that story with you because not only was it pivotal in my life, but I think every single one of us can relate to that story. Some of you here have heard those very same words in your life. And even if you didn't hear those words, every one of us have been hurt, we've been put down, we've been rejected, we've been bullied by somebody. And it's easy to think we're worthless when those things happen. Every one of us have failed in all kinds of ways and we carry a whole lot of guilt and shame over those failures. Very easy to conclude, I'm not worth anything. For many of us, as we get older or struggle with chronic illnesses, very easy to think, I have no value whatever left in this world. But the message of Christmas, even though those outer voices and those inner voices say something different, the message of Christ, the message of Christmas is completely opposite. It says very clearly in Christ there are no nobodies. And that's what I want us to think about this morning as we look at Luke's account of the birth of Jesus from three perspectives. I want us to look at and see an extraordinary message of grace given, received, and shared. So let's think together about those for for just a little bit. First about this message of grace that's been given. Now, you know the Christmas story. Mary and Joseph, they go up from their home in Nazareth to Bethlehem to be counted for the census and there... Mary gives birth to Jesus in a stable because he couldn't find a place to stay. But while that was happening in the city, out in the country, God is visiting a bunch of shepherds. And he visits them to give them this extraordinary message of grace. He says, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. To you, personally. He is Christ, the Lord. Now, that message is extraordinary on a number of levels. For one, it was extraordinary because of the angelic chorus and this light show that had to have taken taken place, a company of angels, a company of thousands of people. That had to have been something to see, an extraordinary event. But that event was extraordinary on an even deeper level because of whom God brought the message to. He brought it to a bunch of shepherds. Now, in this day, back in that day, the shepherds, they they were really the bottom of the food chain. I mean, they were poor. They smelled bad. They didn't live in houses. They slept on the ground. Nobody wanted to be around the shepherds. They had no civil rights. They were not allowed in the courts. They had to go through extremely long ritual cleansings to even go into a temple, which they never could do because they couldn't leave their, sh- their, their flocks, so they weren't in the temples either. They had no civil rights. Now, I want you to think about something for a minute. If you were God and you were about to give the most extraordinary message of grace humankind has ever known, to whom would you give it? Mr. Chip told us when he talked to the kids. Most of us would give it to the high and mighty, the powerful. I would in that day have given it to the priests and the teachers of the law because these guys were the powerful ones. They had the ability to gather a crowd. They had the expertise to explain theologically the message that God was sending his people, but God didn't choose them. He chose the shepherds, but why? Why would he choose the shepherds? Well, I think there's several reasons. I mean, one, God was going to show the world how he worked. It wasn't going to be the wise, but the foolish. It wasn't going to be the proud, but the humble. It wasn't going to be the rich, but the poor. It wasn't going to be the strong, but the weak. This is how the kingdom of God comes, how God operates. And the reason is so that there'd be absolutely no question of who is doing the work here. He also did it because he wanted 
the shepherds to know just how much they meant to them, to him. That the gospel, the good news was for everybody. And so precious were the shepherds to Jesus himself that he would take their occupation as his name, the good shepherd who cares for his sheep, who goes after the lost ones, who lays down his life for the sheep. He did it in another sense to authenticate Mary and Joseph's calling, especially Joseph. I mean, they had both been visited by an angel in the dream. I think for Joseph, it would have been particularly easy to conclude, I must have just imagined that whole thing. The shepherds authenticated that call. But the most important reason God did it the way he did it was for his own glory and for his own praise. And we see that in the angels. We see it in Mary. We see it in the shepherds. I want you to think about it this way. It brought God great joy to give joy to the world, to Mary and Joseph, and to the shepherds because he knew when he gives us that kind of joy the natural response will be glory and praise to him. Our joy and God's glory are always tied together. They're inseparable. When God pours out his message of grace in his son, Jesus Christ, while it's for our joy, ultimately it's for his glory. So the question is this morning, one of the questions is, how much glory and praise have we given him this Christmas? Do we just limit it to Christmas? Do we get that this extraordinary message of grace that's been given to us is such that we matter so much to him that he would send his son for us to give us joy and hope that we might give him glory and praise? That is the message of grace. In Christ, the good shepherd, there's not one of us, not one, who is too low, too insignificant, too unimportant, too forgotten, too broken, too shameful, too much of a failure, too sick, too young, too old, too anything, that God doesn't love you. Do you understand how joyful, how glorifying that message is? Do you realize that Christ, the good shepherd, wants to tend to you? All for your joy and his glory. He'll not leave you or forsake you for your joy and his glory. If you wander off, he'll come looking for you for your joy and his glory. And he laid down his life for your joy and his glory. That's the extraordinary message of grace that's been given to the world and given to us this Christmas. And I don't want us to miss it. A message of grace given. Secondly, a message of grace received. The shepherds heard it. They saw it. And look at what they did. Let's go to Bethlehem, they said, and see this thing that's happened. So they hurried off. They found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. That is a natural response to God's grace. To receive something is not just take it in your ear, but to take it and act upon it. Grace it's getting something, receiving something we don't deserve. And the shepherds absolutely understood that this night. I believe that. I mean, they knew who they were in the eyes of the world. That's why they kept to themselves. But now they understood because this extraordinary message of grace had been given to them. They understood afresh who they were in God's eyes. They set off then to find their Savior, to worship Him. You see, when you've been given grace like this, there's only one thing to do. Worship the one who is the grace giver. What is worship? Worship is when we give proper worth or value or due to something. And listen, make no mistake about it, we all worship something. Whatever you give the most time, the most thought, the most energy to, the most investment to, that is the thing you worship. And listen, that can be anything. It can be good and bad alike. I mean, it can be 
good health or good looks. It can be a boyfriend or a girlfriend. It could be a spouse. It could be children or grandchildren. It could be a career. It could be goals. It could be a hobby. It could be possessions or power or pleasure. It can be almost anything. And none of those things are really bad unless we make them more important than God. We invest more in them than we do in the Lord. Now, it's interesting to note, not only do you give value to the things you worship, they give value to you. So your value is only as high and lasts as long as the thing you worship. Look at what the Bible says about Jesus. He's the image of the invisible God. By him all things were created, things in heaven, on earth, visible, invisible, thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Wow, when I read that, that's just staggering. Because you see, in Christ there is infinite value. So when we worship Him, that value is given to us. Christ makes a somebody. And you know what? If we are honest deep down, to be somebody is really our greatest human desire. But how does that happen? I mean, it happens like it did with the shepherds. It begins by understanding before God we're all nobodies. Now, don't misunderstand me here. I'm not saying that we don't do good things and we're good people, nice people. I believe we are. I'm talking about our sin. And our sin's not just the things we do wrong. It's a heart that's wrong to the things of God. And because the holy cannot bear the presence of the unholy, we can't even stand before the Lord. So in a very real sense, we are nobodies. We cannot stand before the Lord on our own. So our greatest need is to have our relationship with God restored. But we can't do that either because it's a heart issue. But the good news is our greatest desire to be somebody and our greatest need for reconciliation with God both find their solution in Jesus Christ. That's why he came. That's the very essence of Christmas, that God humbled himself. He took on flesh, and he came down to our level to do for us what we could not, never, ever do for ourselves. When I was a kid, about six years old, I got the second best Christmas gift I ever got in my life as a kid. Electric train. I told you about the go-kart a few years ago. This electric train. I love electric trains. My daddy took this electric train, he got this four by eight sheet of plywood, and he made this little town on it. And the town had grass, and it had trees, and it had a pond, it was a mirror, you know. It had hills, it had buildings, it had cars, it had people on this track that wove all through this little town he had made. It was the coolest thing I'd ever seen in my life until I saw Chip's train room. <laughs> That's all right, though. When you're six, this was it, you know. I love that, I love that train set. It was such a surprise to me and such a joy to me. My dad still has that board in his garage because he doesn't throw away nothing. I love that train. I played with that thing. I played with that thing round and round and round and round. And my dad, the whole time, standing over me, go, now, Bill, keep it slow. Hold it down. That train will go off the track. Well, this won't come as a shock to any of you. <laughs> I didn't listen to him. I had to see how fast the train would go. So I'm ripping that train around that track, and it didn't take but a second for the train. It's gone. It's off the track. Now, I'm standing over the train track, six-year-old kid. I'm trying to get the train back on the track, and you know how the car's got the wheels that are doing this. And I'm doing this, and I cannot get that thing back on the track. And my dad's watching me. He's seeing me struggle. Finally, he comes over, and he goes, Bill, you cannot do that from above. 
you got to get down at the track level. So he lays down on the floor. We can see them wheels. He puts that train right back on the track, and we went at it again. Of course, it didn't take but a second. It's off track again. But then I knew how to put it on. He said, you can't do that from above. You've got to get down at the track level. And I think that's a great way to understand Christmas. You see, because of our sin, the human race had de derailed and it needed to be put back on the track of life with God. And we couldn't do it ourselves. And God wouldn't do it from above. He had to come down to our level. And that's what he did in sending his son our Lord Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, who came as a baby in the manger but grew up to be the man of Calvary, who lived and he died and he rose again to put us back on track by paying for our failures and restoring our relationship with God. That's the simple message of God's grace that's been given to all of us today. But you know what? If we only hear that message... And we don't embrace it personally. That message is, is of no value to us. This is a message that has to re be received personally by faith. I'm not talking about going to church more. I'm not talking about doing more religious stuff, though that's important. I'm talking about surrendering your life to Jesus Christ fully and finally. You see, the good news of Christmas and year-round is that all who receive Christ by faith as Savior and Lord receive not only his forgiveness, which reconciles us with God, which is our greatest need, we receive his value, which is our greatest desire. I have a question for you this morning. If you're here today, you're not a Christian, you don't have a personal relationship with Christ, or maybe you're visiting with us online, and you say, I don't really know Jesus. I totally understand. I was that way for a long, long time. I got a question for you this morning, and not a rhetorical question. It's a question I want you to think about and answer. This morning, what is your greatest desire, and what is your greatest need? It's a question Christians ought to ask and answer too. Now listen, with all due respect, if the answer is not Jesus to both of those things, even if you get them, you are going to be disappointed. They will let you down. But Christ won't. So the question is, what are you going to do with Jesus now that Christmas is over? Will you leave him as a baby in a manger? Will you put him away with the rest of your Christmas decorations? Or will this be the year you embrace him as your loving Savior? Don't ever forget the Son of God came for one reason, because he loved you. That was it. If you doubt that, look at that little manger for a bit and see the Son of God humbled Gentle, defenseless, dependent child. But don't stop there. Look at that cross at Calvary and see the blood that stains it from top to bottom. But don't stop there. Look at that empty tomb. Couldn't contain our Savior. And look at those hands, the nails, the scars. Those hands he holds out to you this morning. He says, take them, child came for you the shepherds heard the extraordinary message of grace and they received it and they went and found their savior what is keeping you from doing the same thing today come and talk to me come and talk to Glenn you can know this Savior. We want you to know this Savior. He came for you. A message of grace given and received. Finally, a message of grace shared. God chose to give this extraordinary message of grace first to the shepherds. They received it. They went and worshipped Jesus. 
And then look what happened next. When they had seen him, they spread the word. What do you do when you receive really, really good news? What do you do with it? Come on. You tell somebody, right? When I got that train track that Christmas, I could not wait to tell my buddies. As soon as my mom and dad let me, I bolted out of that house. I ran over to my best friend's house across the street. I drug him out of his house to my house. Come on, you are going to come play with this train with me. It's the coolest thing you've ever seen in your life. And he did. See, that, that train track was way too cool to keep to myself. I could not keep that thing to myself. Now, I want you to go back in time to a place in your life that was just like me, that little six-year-old boy at Christmas. Go back in your mind's eye to that place where you got really good news. It may be many places. Go back to one of them. Maybe when you got that great, that great Christmas gift. Maybe it's when you graduated and got your diploma. Maybe it's when you got your first job. Maybe it's when you got engaged or the day you got married or the day you had that child. Maybe it's when you celebrated that 50th wedding anniversary. Maybe it was the day you got the good news that the tests were negative. Go back to that place, that time. Now, Imagine trying to keep that to yourself. You couldn't do it. Why? Good news has to be shared or it's not good news. It's just news. Every single day, I read the news and I don't share it with anybody. Why? Not worth sharing. This news, though, this is different. This news is worth sharing. The good news of Christ is by far the best news a person can ever get in this lifetime. But those who have received it have to share it or it is really not good news to you. Fact is, somebody in your life today needs really good news. And you know who that person is. What are you going to do with it? And look at what happens when we do. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. Nobody was amazed at anything the shepherd said, not even other shepherds. But all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. You see, when we're faithful to tell others about Jesus, God is faithful to amaze folks with that news. It's not the high and the mighty, the rich and the powerful, but the everyday men and women, boys and girls, the shepherds of the world who receive the gift of Christ and go tell others about it. It is, however, the high and mighty God that amazes folks' hearts with the truth of Christ. We got a job to do, folks. Your story matters. I've said that before. Your story matters. Telling folks your story because in Christ, you're part of the Christmas story. You're a recipient of this story. Deep down, we all want to be somebody. We want to be known, we want to be loved, we want to be valued in spite of all of our errors, in spite of our flaws, in spite of all the screw-ups in our lives. But too often we listen to the outer voices that say you're worthless and you'll never amount to anything. Or we listen to the inner voices of shame and guilt that say the same thing. But the voice of the Lord is different. It says, uh-uh. Those things aren't true. I've loved you with an everlasting love. I've drawn you with loving kindness. 
I am with you, I'm mighty to save, I take great delight in you, I quiet you with my love, and I rejoice over you with singing. That's a totally different voice, y'all. These prophetic words written hundreds of years before Jesus was born were pointing to him. And they found their fulfillment in him. And their truth for you and me today, regardless of what the voices of the world or the voices of our own hearts say. This is the same message of grace that God delights in sharing over and over and over again. And whatever Christ gives you, nobody and nothing can take it away. But for that unchanging message of God's grace to become personal and take up residence in our hearts, we have to hear it. It's been given to us. We have to receive it by faith and we have to share it. So hear Christ's words for you this morning. Receive them by faith and then take them into the world and tell somebody else about them. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ, the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we give you glory and we give you honor. And we give you praise for your goodness and grace. So much did you love your people that you sent your son to, for us. Oh Lord, we know he came as a baby in a manger in Bethlehem so long ago. And we join with the faithful in proclaiming your glory with thanksgiving for sending him. But we know he didn't stay a baby in a manger. We know he grew up to be the man of the cross where he died in our place and he rose for our sake. Oh Lord, let the truth that began its work at Christmas and worked its way out throughout the life of Jesus and has worked its way out in our lives and continues to work its way out in our lives in this world, let it become ever more real today that we wouldn't just put Jesus away with the Christmas decorations, but we would carry him into the world with this message of grace and good news and glad tidings for all men upon whom God's favor rests. We got the only message of hope this world needs. May we tell it. And tell it with great joy and great expectation that you will still amaze people when Christ's life and death is proclaimed. We ask these things in his name. Amen.